Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. Welcome to Hawkinsville, First United Methodist Church. On this Sunday after Easter, we had a great Easter celebration last week. It was a wonderful time to be together as our church family. And we know that Easter continues this morning as well, and we are grateful for that. Uh, We don't think that Jesus went back into the tomb after Easter Sunday. No, he is risen. He is alive, and he reigns forever as our Lord and King. Uh, I was telling the early service this morning that uh, after we had the sunrise service last week, which was at 7 o'clock, and I had to preach that, there is no chance that I'll be changing our early service to 7 o'clock every week, because that, that's not for me getting up that early, but we did have a good time at the sunrise service, but we had a great time this morning as well, moving back to our normal 9 o'clock time. So I invite us to enter into this uh, time this morning uh, with a grateful heart as we worship the risen Lord together. Uh, The God who raised Jesus from the dead, he also raises us to new life as well. May God come and bring his new life to us, to our church, and to our world this day. And now I'm going to invite Harley to come and bring our announcements. Welcome again. I was told that the Easter... Sunday is the big deal for the year, but that the Sunday after Easter is called Low Sunday. I'd never heard that, but I'm glad to see everyone here, and happy Sunday after Easter to you all. Men's coffee and devotion time will be Monday morning at 7, and all men are invited. We'll meet tomorrow in the social hall. We hope to see you here with us. Remember the blue reservation cards for Wednesday night supper. We've done a great job with them so far. If you would please write down if you plan to attend dinner on Wednesday. And we look forward to seeing you here at 6 o'clock. If you don't fill out a card, just call Nancy and let her know you plan to be here for dinner. We're not going to have our let's make a deal, special deal this week. Uh, We've been postponed because our special guest has a scheduled conflict. But we will reschedule for a good date in the fall. And we look forward to having that event But this Sunday will be our regular Wednesday night supper, so please come with us. Joan Tripp has very kindly donated Kim's piano to replace the one that's in the social hall. If you're interested in the one that's in the social hall, please call Barbara Lawson, and we would love for someone to have that piano. The children's spring musical will be held on Wednesday, May 18th at 6.30, following the Wednesday night supper. So we look forward to that, and our practice times are in the bulletin. All aboard for the Rocky Railway Railway for 2022 Vacation Bible School. We're looking forward to this year's Vacation Bible School on June 20th through 24th. All kids are invited, pre-K rising through the 6th grade. Don't forget to register. A beautiful red maple tree has been planted on the north lawn of the church outside of Cochran Hall. The tree is given by Cheryl Green in memory of Jerry. And what a beautiful tree it is. Thank you, Cheryl. Please see that on the north lawn outside of Cochran Hall. Today's the 24th, and it is Carlette and Tommy Gibson's anniversary, their 44th. Happy anniversary. It's Linda Williams' birthday. Happy birthday, Linda. Tomorrow is David and Maggie Griffin's 13th anniversary. That's tomorrow. Harris Churchwell celebrating a birthday on Tuesday. Nancy Wall celebrating a birthday on Friday. Happy birthday to Nancy. Have I missed any birthdays or anniversaries? Or does anyone have an announcement for us? Okay. Well, Nancy Hunt has a special announcement for us. Nancy, if you'll come talk with us. Good morning. I came to early service and made this announcement, and I really got a lot of names signed up for the Bible Reading Marathon. If you remember, we participated in that last year. Now, I'm going to, get, I'm going to tell you this, then I will tell you what I ask for. Broad Street Baptist Church is covering 
Monday from 7 in the morning until midnight. Um, Westview Baptist Church is covering from 6 a.m. until midnight on Wednesday. Now, I only ask for 15 slots. And I want you to know, since this morning when I approached the people in the first service, I have eight people signed up. So you don't have to do a lot today, but I hope when I leave that this list will be filled. Our time is Tuesday, May the 3rd. We start at, set at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with Pastor Varnell leading us off, and we go until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And Allison Ricks, sweet little Allison, will close us out. So I have a table in the back. Please see me, and let's get all of these slots filled out. I volunteered for poll service, watching service this year, and wouldn't you know, they gave me this date. So I can't be there to read, but I know you will all be there, and all the slots will be filled. Thank you. Excuse me. As Jack said, we're still celebrating Easter, and we'll celebrate it right on, the risen Lord. So we're going to open with 327, crown him with many crowns, as we stand together and sing the first, second, and fourth verses of crown him with many crowns. <laughs> Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory.
let's take a minute and pass the peace with our friends and families. Before we go into our time of prayer this morning, I wanted to say uh, last year I remember doing the Bible reading marathon. I had my part, and y'all, I got to confess, I had some of the hardest names I've ever had to read in my section uh, during my time. So if you're worried about uh, messing up names or messing up places when you're out there reading, don't worry about it because you cannot butcher something worse than I butchered all those names I did last year. But uh, also, uh, Nancy mentioned in the last service that uh, if you're expecting some uh, crowd out there and you're kind of nervous about speaking to them, it's not that way. There's really not many people out there. You're kind of just reading between you and the Lord. So if you don't like public speaking, it's okay because it's not very public. So uh, we would hope you'll come and do that. And maybe Nancy can get all of her uh, places checked off and we can have a great attendance from our church. If you'll uh, bow your heads, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord, we thank you for this great privilege of worship today. Uh, We never want to take this moment for granted because we know that you are so good to us. You have done so much for us. We could never repay you, but what we can do is worship you. And so we celebrate you here in this place today. We know that the church is not about us. We know that worship is not about us. It's all for you. It's all about you. You deserve every bit of worship that we can give. And we give you our everything this day. And we continue to thank you for the good news of Easter and the resurrection. It really is news that changed the whole world forever. And our lives have been changed because of it. You raised your son Jesus from the dead. Death could not hold him down. The tomb did not win the day. Jesus was victorious. And through him, we find our victory as well. Lord, we thank you for making a way for us. Thank you for allowing us to participate in Christ's victory because we're not good enough on our own, but in Christ and through Christ, we have all that we're ever going to need. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to live as your victorious people this week. Not in a way where we act like we're better than other people or or trying to shame and humiliate other people, but help us to live as those who have died to sin and been raised to new life. Help us to live as those who have put off the old self and put on the new self. Help us to live as those who have been transformed by the resurrection and have found the greatest power and the greatest news this world has ever known. Lord, we know that we are commissioned to be sharers of that good news. We're not meant to keep it to ourselves. We're meant to be witnesses to the good news. And Lord, we want to dedicate our lives to it. May we live for nothing more than the good news of Christ and his resurrection. May we live to love and to share, to proclaim, to live out the reality of Easter, giving thanks to you along the way living for you, praising you in all that we do. May we honor and glorify you. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. As we pray now together the great prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And let's pray. Lord, for all the good you've given us, we are thankful. We're grateful to be saved by your holy grace. We thank you for our wonderful church and our church family and all those that can't be with us here today. Please accept these gifts. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Thank you, choir, for that great anthem. I uh, just want uh, to remind the church that I'm going to be gone this week. I'm heading up to uh, Gettysburg with some South Georgia preachers, taking a, a retreat up there. We're going to a, a leadership Bible and history retreat with somebody who's going to be leading that, and we're very excited about that. So keep me in your prayers as we travel up there to Gettysburg. We're all friends at the moment, but we're going to be in a minibus for about 10 hours, so we'll see if we're all friends after we get done with this thing. So uh, hopefully we will be, and uh, looking forward to going up there and and then being back with you next Sunday morning. Well, today we're beginning a new series called Next Steps. We're going to be following Jesus after the resurrection and seeing what that means for our lives today. And the title of today's sermon is Locked Doors. And I invite you to hear these words from John chapter 19, verses, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. That's John 20, 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Hank the Tank. Might not be a name you're familiar with. Let me tell you about Hank. Hank was a 500 pound black bear in the community of South Lake Tahoe, California. And Hank was causing problems. The problem with Hank is that Hank kept breaking into people's houses looking for leftover pizza and other food. Hank broke into at least 28 houses, coming in through garages and windows and doors. And experts concluded that it was Hank's diet of human food that led him to be so big. And I can relate to him there. I know what Hank's going through. Uh, The residents were quick to point out that Hank was very gentle and sweet. One towns lady said this, When he breaks into a home, he is far more interested in the food than any people who may be inside. He just sits there and eats. He doesn't attack them, he doesn't growl, and he doesn't make rude faces. Well, that's nice of Hank, isn't it? Let's be real this morning. As cool of a bear as Hank the Tank seems to be, breaking in for leftover pizza, can you imagine the terror of waking up to a 500-pound bear in your house? This is what locks and alarms and outdoor cameras are all about, right? There are certain things that you don't want coming into your home. And a 500-pound bear named Hank the Tank seems to be pretty high on that list of things I don't want in my house. I think it's safe to say that being Fearful of a gigantic bear is a very normal thing. We all value security, don't we? We all want to be safe. We all value protection, and understandably so. But the problem is that we can never really keep ourselves 100% safe, can we? There are too many things that are not in our control, right? For instance, when I'm out driving on the road, I can't control what the other bozos are going to do in their car. I know I'm going to stay in the right lane. Are they going to stay in the right lane? I don't know. We can't control everything. Back in the time of Jesus, the disciples were not immune from this desire of control either. They, just like us, wanted to make sure that they were safe. They wanted to be protected. They experienced fear. At this point in the story, after the crucifixion, they felt like their world was crumbling around them. We can understand that, can't we? Sometimes we feel like our world is crumbling around us, too. And what we see here in the text are the disciples shut up behind these locked doors. The disciples were hiding out behind these locked doors. Why? For fear of the Jewish leaders. You see, Jesus has been arrested. Jesus has been executed on the cross, and the disciples were scared that they might be next. Because they'd been associated with Jesus. 
They've been the followers of Jesus. And so it makes sense that the authorities might be looking for them to make an example out of them next. Their fear was very real. Well, our situations might be a little different today. But we all have moments in life when we're afraid, don't we? We all have moments when we don't know the way forward. Life is full of uncertainties where we don't even know what the next day or the next hour is going to bring. Well, I think that this scripture has something very important to teach us about living the Christian life in the midst of a fearful and scary world. First of all, while we don't have Hank the Tank breaking into our homes, we do find that Jesus makes his end meets us in the very places of our fear. He doesn't leave us alone. You know, this has to be one of the most fascinating stories in the New Testament to me because the text is very clear that the doors were shut, they were locked, and Jesus just appears among them. The once crucified but now risen Jesus makes his physical appearance behind the locked doors. I can't explain that. I don't know how that happened. Now, if I were Jesus, the first thing I would have done would be to chastise those disciples. I would have said, you blockheads, you ran at the first sign of trouble. Y'all left me. You denied me. Y'all didn't even show up to the cross. But luckily, that's not the kind of God that we have. Jesus doesn't shame us for our failures. Jesus does not condemn us for our sins. Jesus is so much better than what we actually deserve. What he does say is, peace be with you. He says it twice, actually. This could be the catchphrase of the post-resurrection Jesus. Peace be with you. This could be uh, something that was a typical Jewish saying back in the time, but it was also something that Jesus had promised to his disciples earlier in John's Gospel. Back then, Jesus had said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. He also said, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to face persecution, but take courage for I have conquered the world. What we find here is that on the other side of his death, Jesus resurrected brings his true peace to us. And I take great comfort in that fact today. For I believe that Jesus meets us right in the places of our fear, bringing us his peace. I mean, we know that we're going to face hardships in this life. We know that life is not always going to be easy. Things are not always going to work out in our favor 100% of the time. And one of the greatest things we can do is to acknowledge that and be prepared for it. But in the very times of our biggest fears, we find that Jesus doesn't leave us alone. Jesus makes his way in. Sometimes we didn't even expect it, like the disciples behind those locked doors. But Jesus comes bringing his peace anyway. Is there a situation in your life right now that needs peace? Unexpected news from a doctor, financial woes, marital strife, worries about friendships and fitting in, problems at work, addictions taking over, worries about the future, relationship troubles. Jesus comes in and speaks, peace be with you. May our hearts be filled with the peace of God this day, the peace which passes all understanding. The peace which meets us right in the middle of our fears and does its healing work. The second thing that jumps out to me is that in the midst of a fearful and scary world, Jesus gives us a mission. You see, after Jesus had shown the disciples his his wounded hands and side, he speaks peace to them again and then gives them their mission. He says, as the Father has sent me, so now I am sending you. Isn't it amazing that not only does Jesus meet us in our fears, but he also gives us something to do. He makes us a part of the work he's doing in the world. He makes us a part of his team. Have you ever been a part of a sports team before? 
baseball, softball, basketball, football, soccer, tennis, cheerleading. Uh, it's a great feeling to have these teammates who are around you, who are there by your side to, to play the game with, to build relationships with. People who can pick you up when you fall down or can uh, cheer you on when things are not going great. I remember the first time I went out for a sports team that I actually had to train for. You, know, you, you, you play team. And I got to tell you, I preferred it that way. I preferred just paying the money. And then I was on the team. I knew I was good to go. Uh, in eighth grade, I remember trying out for my middle school basketball team. I loved basketball. I had played rec league ball all the way up until that point. So this was my chance to take it to a new level. This was my chance to be the next Jordan, and I was looking forward to that. Uh, announcements for tryouts came, and I went with some buddies of mine. We tried out all week long, running these drills and shooting and practicing different sets. And then the dreaded list came out. You know the list? The list of, of, of the team, they go and put it on the bulletin board, and you see who all made it. Well, I was one of the ones who did not make it. I was crushed. I, I hope none of you ever had that feeling when you were growing up, because it's not a great feeling to not make the team. But did you know that as Christians, we all make the team? There's no Christian that Jesus looks at and says, okay, you can be a Christian, but you're not part of the team. You don't have anything to do for the mission. That would be soul crushing, wouldn't it? No, we're all made part of the team and of the mission by Jesus, the risen Messiah. We're all called to take part in his work in the world. You see, as the Messiah, Jesus was God's king to the world, the one who was sent from the Father to show the, God's love to everybody. And in that same way, we are being sent out to be the representatives of Jesus. And that means that our lives have great purpose. Did you know that your life has a great purpose? We are all living for something so much more important than the latest news story that we find on cable news. Or the next day at work. Or the next trip or vacation we're going to take out of town. Or living for our favorite political candidate. We are living for God's mission in the world. And there is nothing more important than that. Well, Jack, what is that mission? The mission of God is to bring God's love to everybody. Doing good, sharing, helping, practicing kindness and mercy. Extending forgiveness. Being people of hope. Spreading God's blessing to everyone. We can all ask ourselves today how we're doing at living out God's mission. You know, where does my life fall short of this? Where am I doing good at it? Where am I living into God's calling? And how can I do more of that? How can I dedicate myself to the mission and what God wants me to do? Let me tell you what the kingdom needs right now. The kingdom of God needs people who are totally dedicated to the mission. It needs people who are solely focused on making the good news of Jesus Christ known and inviting new people to be a part of it. The kingdom needs people who are committed, devoted, loyal, enthusiastic workers for God's mission. You see, a reserved for somebody else. This isn't a situation where we let somebody else do all the work. No, we must all take on the call of Jesus to be his people in the world. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, he said. Finally, what we learn from this story is that Jesus gives us the power to live out that mission. Here's the thing. If living out the mission were just up to us and our own power, we wouldn't make it very far, would we? I mean, do you think I could be a preacher on my own without the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in me? Absolutely not. I don't thrive on public speaking. This is not my idea of a fun time. I, 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 don't, I don't love getting up in the morning and say I get to get in front of everybody and talk today. But with God's Spirit in me, we can accomplish far more than we ever thought we could. With God's power in us, we are equipped and capable of doing everything that God wants us to do. 
after giving the disciples their mission, John writes, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, as Christians, we believe in the triune God, one God, three persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God living in us, dwelling inside of us, empowering us from the inside out. The Spirit is the one who gives us everything we need for living out God's mission in the world. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. John says that God spoke to him. God said, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John testified that he saw this take place. He says, I myself have seen and testify that this man Jesus is the Son of God. That means that Jesus is the one with the Holy Spirit. And he's the one who gifts the Holy Spirit to his followers. He covers us with his Spirit. He sends the Spirit into our hearts. He fills us up with the Spirit and makes us fit for God's mission and God's work in the world. You know, I've heard it said before that the Holy Spirit is the power source that our lives are meant to run on. The Holy Spirit is our juice. The Holy Spirit is our battery. The Holy Spirit is the thing that makes us go. Have you ever had that dreaded thing happen where your phone is running low on battery and you can't get to a charger fast enough because you got to have juice, got to have battery so you can get charged up and ready to go? Or think about our cars. Our cars have a battery that's meant to work and turn on every time we need to go somewhere. Have you ever gotten in your car and you turn that key or you push that button and nothing happens? It's not a great feeling, is it? The Holy Spirit is the gift of Jesus to us, charging us up, filling us up, empowering us from the inside out to live as God's people in the world. Now, good news today, if you are a Christian, you already have the Holy Spirit at work in your life. But there may be some other stuff that's getting in the way of the Spirit's voice in your life. What can we do about that? How can we make more room to hear God's Spirit, to experience God's Spirit? Well, we can slow down. Some of us are just so busy doing so much stuff, we're always moving through life so quickly. Take some time to slow down. Pray daily. Prayer makes room for God's Spirit to work, to bring some stuff to the surface in our lives. We can also read Scripture on a daily basis. Learn more about God's story and God's work in the world and how we fit into that. We can also worship on a weekly basis to get more in tune with God's Spirit. Because there's something important about how God's Spirit works when we're all gathered together, right? God's Spirit speaks into our lives in a real way through worship. We can also shut off some of the noise. And i got to confess to you that I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I've always got some music playing in the background. Or I'm watching YouTube on my phone or on my computer. or, Or I've got the TV going in the background. There's always some noise And there's very rarely quiet. One of my mentors encouraged me to take a walk outside and leave my phone inside. Do you know how hard that is to leave your phone behind? Go outside. Be quiet. Look at nature. Talk with God. Slow down. We can and we must make room for God's spirit to work and speak in our lives. Yes, We live in a fearful world. We live in a world where Hank the Tank can break into our homes at any time. That's a little terrifying. That's why I keep a few extra frozen pizzas in my house at all times, just in case Hank makes his way in there. I can toss one his way, and we'll be good to go. It's a fearful world, but we also live in a new world where Jesus can make his way into our fearful places bringing us his peace. Did you know that Jesus continues that work today? That Jesus meets us where we are. He meets us with a mission, and he gives us the marvelous power of the Spirit of God. And then we are commissioned to go out and be his people in the world. 
We go out to spread God's mercy and God's forgiveness to everyone. We go out to share the good news with the world that God is not mad at us, that God does not condemn us, but that God loves us, all of us. And God wants us to be his. He wants to be our God forever and ever. And no locked door is going to stand in his way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the good news of the resurrection. We know that Easter continues. We know the reality of the resurrection continues. Jesus alive. Jesus reigning at your right hand. Jesus on the move through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we are so thankful that Jesus comes to meet us exactly where we are. In the midst of the tough times of life, in the midst of the difficult times of life, the scary times, we know that we're not left alone. Jesus makes his way in. He speaks to us. He gives us a mission, and then he empowers us to go and be his people. Lord, we want to be that people today. We want to be the people that we were created to be in Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus, the devoted disciples of Jesus, those who go to take the good news to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The day of resurrection is found on page 303. We'll stand together as we sing. As we leave this place today, I invite us to remember that there are next steps. The next steps is where we remember that Jesus meets us in our fearful places. He gives us a mission to be his people. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us all the power that we're ever going to need to choose the right way, to follow the right path, and to be the people that we were meant to be. Go now to do likewise in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.